I read to you from the book of Ruth in the first chapter, 15th verse. So she said, See your sister-in-law, she's gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus, and so to me, and even more, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. This is the word of the Lord. It's hard for me to believe that it was 20 years ago now, 20 years ago this June, that Marsh and I came to Oklahoma. I had been born and raised in Houston. Marsha came there in the third grade. We had been going to First Methodist Church all our lives. We were now married. Our families lived there. Marsha had a wonderful job down in Houston. We had built our own home. Life was great. But when the opportunity came, we prayed and prayed about it. And I, I couldn't put it into words, but I can tell you, I just felt like God was saying, this is the right thing to do. Twenty years later, I have no doubt that it truly was. But saying goodbye to all of our family and friends was tough, especially our friends that we'd come to know so well. And one of those groups of friends was Scott and Julie DeBerry. Scott and Julie were very involved there at St. Luke, at uh, Bear Creek. They, they just were doing everything. And we became very good friends. We would go sailing down in the Virgin Islands. We would go to Oshkosh, Wisconsin every year for the fly-in. It's the largest gathering of airplanes in the United States. We'd go every year to go up to Oshkosh. We worked in the church side by side. We just had fun together. After Marsha, without a doubt, Scott was my best friend. We just played and laughed and lived, and it was so good. And so to have to go and tell them, we said, how are you going to tell Scott and Julie? We're, we're leaving, and we're going to Oklahoma. We did tell them, and they were so very gracious about it and said they understood and we'd still get together, and sure enough, we did. I mean, after we moved up here, we still would go travel together, and they would come up, and when we took a mission trip to Russia, Scott and his son Jordan would go with us. We would still see them some. When we got ready to leave Houston, I'll never forget, Scott said, we're going to come by, and we want to take you guys out to to eat on your next to last night. We know the last night will be crazy. We'll come get you on Tuesday night. Be ready at 7 o'clock. So at 7 o'clock, we were ready, and Marsh and I were waiting, and there was a knock at the door. He said, be dressed up. We're going out fancy. And so there was a knock at the door, and when I opened the door, Scott wasn't there. But instead, there was a chauffeur. And sitting out in the driveway was this big, long, white limousine. Now, I got to tell you, I had never ridden in a white limousine. I can also tell you, I could get used to riding in white limousines. Wow, I had never had that experience. And we went out there, the chauffeur opened the door, and we climbed in, and there was Scott and Julie, and we took off. They had made reservations at a wonderful restaurant down in the Galleria. We went down, and we had this wonderful meal, and then they'd gotten us a place to go to a club to listen to some jazz music, and then we hopped in the limousine and rode Loop 610, going around looking at the lights of the city, kind of reminiscing, and it was like saying this was going to be it. We had a wonderful evening, no expense spared, and we came driving back out to our house, and when we finally got there, we were about to get out of the car, and Scott said, you guys know how much we love you, and you know how much we're going to miss you. We started to go out and buy you a present so you could put it on your shelf and you'd always think about us, but instead, we decided to give you a memory. We hope you've enjoyed it. And I got to tell you, I, I think about it as if it were yesterday. And I am so grateful for that memory. Because just a few years later, at 4.30 in the morning, one morning the phone would ring and it would be Julie. And she would be saying that the police had just come to her home to inform her that Scott had been killed in a small plane crash. And she said, I'm calling you first so you can tell me what to do. I'd never experienced grief like that before. To 
to lose my best friend. He's 37 years old. Father of three small children. I finally understood grief. This morning, I, I told you that we are the people who know that we have first been loved by Christ. And so we reach out to love others. I thought tonight it would be good if we moved on to say, when you and I are the people who choose to love others, then we're also the people who are going to become acquainted with grief. Because when you choose to love, you become vulnerable. And if you live long enough, you will know grief. You will hurt. I thought it would be a value for us to look tonight at the book of Ruth. Because to me, it's one of the most beautiful books in the Bible, not because of the heroine Ruth, but because of the wonderful person Naomi. For she was the person who was acquainted with grief. Now, many scholars tell us this book of Ruth was probably written after the exile, post-exilic time. We know that, um, we don't, uh, that this book was at an important time in the history of Israel because Israel had two divergent thoughts occurring. After the exile, there was one group that said, we've got to pull in together. We've got to focus on the fact that we are God's chosen people. And so those were the people like Ezra and Nehemiah. But there was another strain of thought that was developing in Israel at that time, and it was more liberal and open. And it was a strain of thought that said, no, we're supposed to be a light to the nations. We must be a place where people who are strangers can come, and we must love them because we know what it's like to be strangers in a foreign land. And so then you had books like Jonah and Ruth. It's a beautiful book. And it is about a woman who understood grief. You remember how it was Naomi and her husband Elimelech who lived in Bethlehem. There was a drought going on. They looked across the Jordan River Valley to the mountains of Moab and they saw green fields. And so they left home and they migrated through the Jordan Valley over into Moab. They settled there and for a while life was good. But then Elimelech died. He had left two sons. Those sons had grown up. They had married Moabite women. Then one son died, and then another son died. And now Naomi found herself alone in a foreign land. She was overwhelmed with that sense of grief. Being in a foreign land wasn't just a physical place. I think it was also a state of mind. She was so far from home and lost. She'd been there 10 years, and now she had to decide how was she going to handle her grief you've lived very long, you've been there. You know what it means to feel so far from home, to feel lost, to know the grief. What do you do to get home? I, I want us to look at Naomi, and I think there's three important things for us to see uh, about Naomi. First of all, first of all, Naomi was a, a person who was willing to love sacrificially even while she was in her state of grief. I, I love the fact that Naomi is sitting here with her two daughter-in-laws saying, I love you enough, you need to stay here. If you go with me back to Bethlehem, you're a foreigner. I don't know that you'll ever get married. I don't know how people are going to treat you. If you stay here with your people and your family, you'll get married, you're going to have a family. It would be better for me if you came home with me to help take care of me. I want you to stay here. It'll be better for you. Have you ever thought about the sacrificial love that Naomi was offering these daughter-in-laws? Just a couple of years ago, we had a speaker come to St. Luke's, um, a man named Eleazar Goldstein. Eleazar was a survivor of the Holocaust. He was 80 years old when he came. And I mean, he was sharp. He was spry. I, this guy was just a, a wonderful man. His wife, Rivka, was there with him. They lived in Jerusalem. And they were here to talk to us, and he wanted to tell us his story. It turned out he had grown up in Poland. And he said with his family, they would worship together. They would pray together. They played together. Life was good until 1939 when the Germans came. They scooped up all of these Jews, and they put them into a ghetto. 22,000 of them they crammed into this small place. And when they got them into this small place, then they wouldn't let them leave, and they couldn't work, and they got hungry, and life was so hard. 
But the Germans, they still needed people to help work, make things go, so they looked for some of the teenagers. Eleazar was a young man, and he was strong, and he had a good spirit. And so he got a job working outside the ghetto there on the German army base. And he would go and work, and he would make money, and then he'd go and buy food, and he would slip back into the ghetto and bring it back to his family and try to help them. He did that for three years. It was hard, but he was always working and coming back to take care of the family. He had a wonderful mom, a dad, two brothers, a younger sister. They were family. And then one day, word went out through the camp. Tomorrow, there's going to be a deportation. If you don't have to be in the camp, don't be in the camp. And when Eleazar heard that, he came back to the camp to be with his family. And when he came home and there was his mom and dad, they said, what are you doing here? You got to get out of here. He said, I want to be with you. And they said, you've got to go, you've got to go. And he said, no, don't make me leave. I want to be here with my family. Oh, there was crying, there was wailing. Please, you got to go, you got to go. He said, no. And finally, it was his mother, who had been very quiet, who came over and took him by the arm and said, we need to take a walk. He said it was seven minutes to walk from their home to the edge of the ghetto. He said, I wanted to stop the clock. I didn't want that seven minutes to go by so fast. We walked arm in arm to the edge of the ghetto. And when we got there, she said, you know you must leave. I have prayed, and I believe you're going to survive. I want you to go, to live, and to tell our story. She then handed him a porcelain cup, and he opened it, and inside was honey. He said, I hadn't seen honey in three years. I have no idea where she got the honey. But she handed me this cup full of honey, and she said, May your life be sweet. Now go. Live and love and tell our story. And he said, I hugged her neck and I kissed her. And she turned around and walked away. And I left the camp. The next day they came through and they swept them all up in a deportation, put them in cattle cars, shipped them to a, a concentration camp with gas chambers, and one day later, they were all gone. 22,000 Jews, every member of his family, gone. Eleazar did survive the Holocaust. He moved to Jerusalem. There he met his wife, Rivka. They had children. And now his children have grown up and had grandchildren. And he said, I'm spending whatever time I have telling our story. Because every time I tell my story, I feel my mother overhead. And I am reminded that my life has been sweet. To love somebody enough that you're willing to let them go. And Naomi loved her daughter-in-laws enough to say, you need to go. After hugging her neck and crying, Orpha went. But Ruth said, I want to go with you. So secondly, I've always thought it was so very powerful that Naomi would take the chance to go home. She'd been gone 10 years. 10 years, but now she's looking back and she is thinking about the love of family and friends. She's thinking back about her God. You know, God in that day didn't always go to Moab. It was more of a God of Moab and the God of Israel. It was about going home, having faith. Oh, she was still angry and she was still hurting and grieving, but somehow there was this trust to take a step and go to trust love that might be there, to trust faith that might lead you. When you feel lost, you're still going to trust to go home. Haven't you ever felt that moment in grief you don't really know where to go? 
It really is about trusting love of God and family and having a faith in something you cannot see, you cannot hold and touch and name, but believing that somehow God is going to hold you up to give you a strength from beyond yourself. You're going to make it. You got to trust. As Phil was telling you, I, I am a private pilot. And I did take up flying originally so I could get my mind off the church. I love church so much, if you're not careful, it gets addicting. And so I, I took up flying lessons because I did find that when you're out taking your flying lessons and, and the instructor says, all right, we're going to learn how to stall the plane, and you start pulling back, and this thing goes up in the sky, and it begins to putt, and then it falls, and you're looking at the ground. At that moment, you were saying something like, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. You don't think about the finance committee. You are closer to God in those moments. That's why I took up flying, and I love flying. And let me tell you, to get it, you've got to go with your instructor, and you take these lessons, and then finally he gets out of the plane, and you've got a solo, and finally when you get through flying enough hours solo, you take your test, and then you can finally take up passengers. And I finally got my license on a Friday. I passed that test on a Friday, and I came home, and I was so thrilled, and I said, Marsha, you're next. <laughs> I said, I want to take you flying, babe. It's going to be so exciting. I said, you've been so supportive, and this is so great. We had a little Cherokee 180, very cheap little old 1968 airplane. There's four place, fixed gear, single engine. I said, get some babysitters for the kid on Sunday. Get the children taken care of. We'll have church. We'll run home, have a quick sandwich, and we'll head out to the airport. So she got the babysitters, and we were so excited. We got through the church, and we ran home, had a quick sandwich, and we headed out the back door. We got to the back door, and suddenly Marcia said, Oh, wait a minute. I forgot something. She went off to the back of the house. She's gone just a little while, came back and said, All right. I said, What'd you forget? Oh, nothing. Let's go. I said, What'd you forget? Nothing. Let's go. By now, man, she had hooked my curiosity, you know. I, thought, I, I don't know what you forgot, but I started heading back through the house. I didn't know if I was particularly looking for anything, but I just started going back through the house. She's behind me saying, come on, let's go, let's go. I got all the way back to our bedroom, and then I suddenly saw it. I knew what it was. Lying there prominently out on top of our dresser was our two wills. This was the first indication I had that she was nervous about flying with me. <laughs> I didn't say a word. I just looked at her, and she just started saying, do you know where those things were? They were buried in the bottom drawer. Nobody would have ever found those things. I said, honey, why is someone going to need to find them? She had nothing to say. We went out and got in the car. We drove out to the airport, and we climbed in, and we, we took off. Unfortunately, that day there was a little turbulence. The plane was kind of bucking and rocking and jumping up and down a little bit. Marsha was strapped in. She had one hand up on the dash and the other hand on the door handle, and she was holding on for dear life. I was wanting to calm her down, and so I finally said, Honey, you know, holding on to the dash and the door handle, if we crash, it isn't going to help you. All it's going to mean is you have a door handle and a piece of the panel in your hand when we crash. I said, Relax. She tried to let go and kind of sit back in the seat a little bit, but I could tell she was still very anxious. And so we'd flown a little further, and I'm thinking, what can I say to help her relax a little bit? And I, I finally said, you know, honey, we can't fall out of the sky. The laws and nature say it's impossible. We can't fall out of the sky. She looked over at me like, right, I got it. I said, no, no, I'm serious. I said, there was a scientist named Bernoulli who discovered a principle. The faster a fluid moves, the lower the pressure. The slower a fluid moves, the higher the pressure. I said, look out at that wing. I said, do you notice how it's curved? That's so that the air rushes across the top of the wing quickly. And if that's rushing quickly, then it creates low pressure. Do you remember the bottom of the wing, how it's nice and flat? The air goes slower underneath the bottom of the wing and that creates high pressure. And that means those air molecules out there that are going slower are holding this wing up in the air. 
it means that literally we can't fall out of the sky. Unless we lose a wing or I turn this thing upside down, but, but that's not going to happen. Again, she just kind of looked at me, but we kept on flying, and we didn't say a lot, but now and then I'd look over and I saw her looking out that window. I knew she was trying to see those air molecules out there holding that wing up in the air, staring out there at that wing. She started to relax a little more. We flew down to Galveston that day. It was a beautiful day. Went down, buzzed along the beach, had a good time flying along, came on back home. By the time we were coming home, she was going, hey, look at that over there. Hey, look at that over there. She was having fun. And when we tied down, when we landed and I tied that plane down, I thought, we're going to have fun flying. Because Marcia has learned how to trust what you cannot see to hold you up. And it is the struggle of faith for us all to trust what you cannot see to hold you up when you feel you have been so lost in that world of grief. Naomi stepped out in faith to go home. To trust that there would be people there who would love her, to trust a God who would guide her. She went forth. And so the third thing, Naomi gets home. When she arrives, it's been more than 10 years, people say, is that Naomi? And they begin to gather around her, and you know the story. Ruth comes home. She goes out to glean the grain in the field. Boaz sees her. In the end, they get married. She winds up having a baby. They name him Obed, and Obed will grow up and have a son, and they name him Jesse, and Jesse will grow up and have a son named David, and Ruth is going to become the great-grandmother of the greatest king of Israel, King David. It's a wonderful story for Ruth. But don't miss what's happening to Naomi. Naomi has been back home. And if you read on towards the end of the story, you will see where it says she is surrounded by her friends and those who love her. And these friends have gathered around and they are saying, Naomi, you have a son. And I tell you that Ruth, your daughter-in-law, she's better than seven sons. And you see Naomi holding this baby. Life has not gone the way that Naomi planned. There isn't a day that goes by that she wouldn't think about Elimelech, her husband, or her two sons. Do not get me wrong. Not a day goes by she would not think about them. Life has not gone the way she would have planned. But what she's discovered is life is still good. That the miracle of all miracles is that God can raise us up out of the depths of grief to where one day we again laugh and smile and embrace life. After every loss, you must choose life again. And it is God who enables us to choose life again. It is not what we planned, but it can be good. Several years back, we had Rachel Remen come to St. Luke's. She's a wonderful lady, written a couple of books, uh, Kitchen Table Wisdom, uh, My Grandfather's Blessing. If you hadn't read them, you're looking for a devotional book, trust me, you will love them. Rachel is Jewish. Uh, her grandfather was a, a Jewish rabbi. She talks about, though, how she grew up and she became a physician, and then she became a counselor. She opened up Common Wheel Cancer Center, and she began doing lots of counseling with different people who struggled with grief death, those sorts of things. And she told a story of a, a lady who came to see her, a lady named Enid. Enid was in her early 70s, and her husband Herbert had passed away. It was their daughters who brought Enid to see Rachel because they were so worried about her. You see, when Herbert died, Enid died too. He had been gone for two years. And for the last two years, Enid had not taken care of the house. She no longer went out to garden. She didn't put on her makeup and go out with her friends. No, she stayed in her bathrobe. She stayed at home, and she looked out the window. Her daughters were so afraid for their mom. 
And so they brought her to see Rachel. She came in and sat down and didn't say anything, and Rachel said, So Enid, why are you here? My daughters are concerned about me. They think that talking to somebody might help, but there's no way that it can help because you cannot understand. And Rachel said, You are right. I cannot understand. Only you know the pain that comes from losing Herbert, the one that you loved so much. She nodded, and they sat there in silence. Finally, Rachel said, So tell me, Enid, if Herbert was sitting here beside us today, what would you say to him? She thought for a while, and then she said, What I would say is, life has gotten so hard. It is so hard. It is hard to eat my meals alone. It is hard to walk the dog at night alone. It is hard to go to bed alone. It is hard to take care of things around the house here. She then began to talk about Herbert and reminisce about memories they had shared. And as she talked about Herbert and these memories, she started to cry. First time she'd cried in almost two years, but she started to cry harder and harder, and then she was sobbing and sobbing, and she couldn't quit crying, and finally she stopped. And Rachel said, is there anything else you need to tell Herbert? She said, yes, I think I'd also like to tell him that I'm a little mad at him. He told me we would grow old together. He told me he was going to be here to take care of me. I would want him to know how much I miss him. She said, you see, I grew up in a family that was rather cold, and they had rules, and we never hugged or kissed. And then I met Herbert, and he was such a man of love. Oh, he taught me how to open up and to love. And Herbert was always helping somebody, this person and that person. He loved this one, and he loved that one. She just went on describing all the things that Herbert did to love and to bless other people. And finally she stopped and Rachel said, He was an amazing man. Yes, he was. So tell me, Enid, if Herbert was sitting beside you today, what do you think he would want to say to you about the way you've lived the last two years? said she was shocked. She did a double take, but she didn't hesitate for a moment. And he, he would say, Enid, what are you doing? Why have you built a monument of pain to me when our whole life was about love? She thought for a moment and she said, you know, maybe there's another way to do this. I've always thought that if I went out with my friends again, if I went out and started smiling and laughing, that somehow it would dishonor him and our love. But now I see it different. I think there's another way to do this. She stood up, she shook Rachel's hand and said, thank you, and she left. Herbert had told her everything she needed to know. Rachel said, I never saw her again. It was about a year later, though, she got a letter back from Enid. And when she opened the letter, there was a newspaper clipping. And it was showing a new ministry that had been begun in their, their community of people coming together to go and fix senior citizens' homes, to help people who were living alone, people coming together to help one another who were alone. And she was the one who organized it. And she was there with friends in the community, and she was smiling and laughing and working. And in close, she had a simple prayer that said, Grief, I raise anchor, I hoist my sail, and I catch the wind. Grief is not about forgetting. Grief is about remembering your love and moving through the pain. It is about choosing to live again. 
It is the grace of God that enables us to love and to hurt and yet to live again. The book of Ruth ends with Naomi sitting there holding a baby surrounded by her friends saying, you are blessed. <laughs>